Is that now working? I think so. Mm, yes. Hello, and welcome to the uh, live stream of the meteorology exam. Uh, same sort of format as I've done in the past. And um, we're going to do a uh, live stream, make some mistakes, make some notes, and yeah, hopefully you can see how to sort of tackle uh, the intimidating thing that is uh, an exam. So we're going to be using the Bristol Ground School um, application, or website, sorry. Um, going to custom make our own exam. I don't want to have the time pressure, um, but you get two hours for the exam. Hopefully we'll be able to do most of this in another two hours, otherwise it's going to be quite a long stream. Uh, we've selected meteorology, we're going to use all the topics and I think there's 84 questions. Let's just do 80, that's a nice round number. And what I've got is um, a little calculator, should I need it? And I've managed to hook up my phone and we can see some notes like that, which is a bit better than the top-down camera that I've done in the past. And that'll come off and on throughout the stream. And yeah, that's pretty much it. We'll get going now. I'll hide my little face. Don't want to be looking at that all day. Right, here we go. So as you see, meteorology, 80 questions. We want to know after our choice and we'll get a random list of questions. Let's start. 80 questions, it's going to be long. Okay, the transition from southwest to northeast monsoon occurs in India. So southwest to northeast monsoon. Um, so that would be northeast in the winter. So the transition would be in the autumn. Yes, there you go. What is the dry adiabatic lapse rate? Dry adiabatic lapse rate is three degrees per thousand feet. Bosh. Marseille information gives you the following meteorological information for Adjathio and Calvi for 1600 UTC. Um, okay, what's the question? 3602, visibility 2000, rain, broken stratocumulus at 1000 feet, overcast alto stratus at 8000 feet. With a bit of few overcast. The ceilings, okay, so ceiling is when there's 50% or more. So broken is 50% or more. So for Ajacio, Ajacio, Ajacatheo, I don't really know how that's pronounced. Let's go Ajacio. Um, broken would count because it's over 50%. So that's at 1,000 feet. So Ajacio at 1,000 feet. And then scattered is only three to four octas. So that doesn't count as a ceiling. Uh, few doesn't count as a ceiling, so it's going to be the overcast at 9,000, so option C. Yeah, as I say, 50%. During periods of cloudless weather over land in the Northern Hemisphere, the... During periods of cloudless weather over the land in Northern Hemisphere, the surface wind speed tends to be highest during the mid-afternoon. The angle between isobars and surface wind direction tends to be greatest in the mid-afternoon. Surface wind tends to be highest at night. Wind tends to back from early morning until afternoon. So this is to do with the temperature differences in between parts of land. So as it gets hot, the air expands out. There can be temperature variations. So that means that when it's hottest during the day, you get the largest temperature difference differences and variations. So I would say it's surface wind speed tends to be highest during the mid-afternoon. Yes, surface friction is greatest at night and least during the day. That's, yeah, that's the good way to think of it. That's probably the correct way to think of it. Um, I'm going to periodically check the comments on the video as well, probably every 10 or so questions just to make sure there's nothing going on. So that's what I'm doing just now. Um, I'm having a little look and I can see a few people tuning in. Hello, 
Nice to see you. Can you hear me okay? Give me a, a sign if you can. If not, I'll just, I'll just assume you can. But yeah, if you can't, please let me know. And yes, cool. Okay, what is the ICAO qualifying term for the described intensity of turbulence? Conditions in which abrupt changes in aircraft attitude and or altitude occur, aircraft may be out of control for short periods. So if it's out of control, it's gonna be pretty, it's definitely gonna be noticeable, um, but it's gonna be pretty extreme. I would say severe if you're out of control. And there's a proper definition of what it means. Uh, refer to the image, what mean temperature, what average temperature is likely on a true course of 270 from 25 east to 10 east at 45 north. Okay, I'm going to write down these because I'll as soon as the image changes over, I'll forget. 270 degrees true from 25 to 10 east at 45 north. Okay. So, you can see that, fine, yes, you can, go. Cool. So, um, 45 degrees north, where's that line? That's 40, that's 50, this is, oh, they've drawn, drawn already, I think. And then we're going from 25 east to 10 east. Yeah, so they've drawn it on already, cool. And what was the question? Mean temperature. So, yeah, quick maths. Uh, let's just grab a calculator. There we go. Uh, so we've got 47 plus 50 uh, plus 51 plus 53. Divide that by 4. We look at an average temperature of 50.25. Uh, minus 50.25. So let's go the closest one, minus 50. There we go. And that's what it's showing here on this image as well. Yeah, those three temperatures take the average. Nice. It's really hard to read from my screen. Is the quality not very good? Hmm. I mean, I think it's at its max quality. It might just be the the stream. You're limited to 720, so it might not be great. Well, I'm limited from 720. Anyway, in which of these temperature brands is ice most likely to form on the aircraft surface? So, um, supercooled water droplets are tend to be the biggest sort of cause which would happen at about zero to minus 10. 10 to zero you get as well, so it's gonna be D or B, I would say. I'm gonna go for B, 10 and less. Ah, nah, I should've gone with my initial thought. Zero to minus 10, there we go. Okay. Right then, let's carry on. A stationary observer in the northern hemisphere situated in a f in front of a depression. The center of the depression passes from west to east and south of the observer. For this observer, the wind. Okay, this is going to be a draw the effing picture. Is that my thing? Oh, that's my little note of the points from earlier. Um, let's rub this out. And what are we talking about? Okay, so a stationary observer in the room series in front of a depression, the center of the depression passes from west, sorry, from west to east. So it's passing, it's going this direction and south of the observer. So the observer is like here, this is our little man for this observer, the wind. So let's imagine that the wind, as it moves over, he's gonna get into sort of this region. So that'd be the wind coming around anti-clockwise, which means it's backs. And then 
So the pressure passed from west to east and south. So initially it would veer and then it would back. So say he was standing here, he initially experiences it. No, it's always backing. It's got to be back then. Yeah, it's constantly changing direction to be more. Um, it's going anti-clockwise as each stage progresses in that drawing. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay, next question. Oh God, so much writing. Um, imagine an aircraft during approach to an airfield which is located in a basin within mountainous area under the influence of a blocking anticyclone in winter. Mark the most reasonable statement given below, Jesus. Okay, so in a basin within a mountainous area under the influence of a blocking anticyclone. So anticyclone, high pressure, in a valley or in a basin in a mountainous region. Um, while approaching the airfield in the late evening hours without the pilot's intervention, the engines of the aircraft are most likely to produce less thrust after breaking through the inversion layer. While approaching the airfield shortly before sunrise, the pilot has to consider turbulence because at first lift will be decreased due to catabatic winds and after breaking through valley inversion layer, lift is likely to improve due to anabatic winds. While well, approaching the airfield in the morning hours, these conditions apply for the possibility of a marked valley inversion, which has to be considered as a potential flight hazard due to decreased lift after breaking through the inversion layer. While approaching the airfield in the early morning after a short period of bumpiness, the engines of the aircraft will deliver more thrust after breaking through the inversion layer if the pilot does not intervene. I think a valley inversion is quite likely in these conditions. So I'm gonna go for C. No, okay. While approaching the airfield in the early morning after a short period of bumpiness, the engines of the aircraft will deliver more thrust after breaking through the inversion layer if the pilot does not intervene. Why is that then? Um, most tornadoes have a movement that usually ranges from, it doesn't go that fast. The actual tornado itself moves fast, but I think it's only about 20 to 40 knots that they move along at. That's just me trying to remember. Yeah, they don't actually move very fast at all, but the speeds inside them are very fast. Yeah, up to 300 miles an hour it says there. Cumulus congestus. I don't think I've ever even heard of that. A cumulus with little, little vertical development, a remnant of a CB, a cumulus that only occurs in association with the intertropical conversion zone, a cumulus that has great vertical ascent. Well, they, that would be a cumulonimbus almost. A cumulus that, with vertical congestus. Hmm. Let's go with little vertical development. No? With great vertical extent. Well, there you go. This isn't going too well so far. Oh well. Okay, so the mean temperature that may be expected to affect this, that segment of the route from the southeast of England to Geneva at flight level 270 is. Okay, so southeast of England to Geneva. This photo here, the quality is really poor on this, so let's say what flight levels are we at? We're at 240 and 300. So the average at flight level 240 is, is gonna be 35 plus 30. Yeah, divided by two. Uh, so what's that, 32 and a half? Yeah. And then up at higher levels, We've got 48 and 44, uh, which combined together is, what, 92? Divide that by 246. And then we're taking the average at 270, was it? Was it 27? Yes, well, 270. Okay, so the average between... Um, 
the difference between this and this one is 46 minus 32.5 and that equals 13 and a half. So the difference in between these two is 13.5, which means that for every uh, flight level that we go up, so if we go 25, that's six flight levels, 13.5 divided by six equals, this is a very roundabout way of doing this, but so we're dropping 2.25 degrees for every flight level and we're going up three flight levels to 270. So multiply that by three, 2.25 times three is what, 6.75, yeah. And it's gonna be 6.75 degrees colder than 32.5, which I suppose we add on if we're working this way. Uh, what's that? That's 39.25. So let's go minus 39. Yeah. Very roundabout way I think I did that, but yes, it worked. Cool. Next question. What have we got? Like this again. Uh, refer to this image, which best describes the significant cloud forecast over Toulouse. Okay, Toulouse here. Isolated CBs, isolated embedded CBs, 270 down below the bottom of the chart, so down below flight level 100. Okay, so broken, come to the base, what about that? Embedded isolated below. CB base below tops at 270. They're embedded is quite a key word, so it means they're within other clouds. Other clouds, surface 270, no, not surface 270. Well separated CB base 100, not necessarily bases below the bottom of the bottom of the chart, so it's below 100. Five to seven octas, cumulus and I think it's A. Yes. Okay. Oh, is somebody answering along? Sorry, I'm not actually looking at the comments very often, but um, cool. So this image, what? Oh God, I didn't even mean to click that, but that was very lucky. <laughs> um, yeah, that's that's snow. That's like mist. I think that's a shower and that's hail. Widespread haze, not mist. There you go. <laughs> that was lucky. Uh, cool. Right, over the ocean at the intertropical convergence zone, um, the prevailing surface wind is over the ocean at the intertropical convergence zone, more than northeast. So that would be northeast or southeast, would be the trade winds. Light and varied in direction, very possible because it's um, actually light and varied in direction, is that right? Hmm. Let me think. That would be the trade winds. And then you've got very low pressure, which means that the wind is rushing in light, moderate or strong with various direction, I'd say. Yeah, light and varied. So due to the intense solar heating near the equator, the warm, moist air is forced up into the atmosphere like a hot air balloon. Because the air circulates in an upward direction, there's often little surface wind in the intertropical convergence zone, unlike the zones north and south of the equator where the trade winds feed. Yes, okay. Um. Which of the following represents the most stable air mass? Okay, so stable air mass, we're thinking flat clouds. So we're not thinking towering cumulus, no. Cumulonimbus, no. Alto cumulus, castellanus. I think castellanus means like like a castle. Um, so like very tall towers. So alto cumulus lenticularis, or lenticular clouds. From mountain waves, you need... Uh, stable air mass for that, so I would say that one. Yes. 
There you go. Right. Check some comments in a few questions. What weather conditions are expected at Paris Airport, Paris or Lee, at 5.50 UTC? A. Refer to the annex. Oh, right, okay, so we're just looking at, right, okay. So there's a warm front approaching. It's not quite hit yet. Warm front we associate with. Uh, the warm front approaching, quite shallow. Um, you'd have like cirrus clouds and generally quite stable clouds. So maybe before the front is approached, we're looking at maybe sort of mid-level clouds. Um, wind direction is following the isobars. It's going to be about two... Uh, 272, let's call it 240 degrees, something like that. Uh, not very strong. Um, yeah, that's kind of all we can really say. Maybe it wouldn't be showers of anything, it would be, if anything, it's going to be sort of continuous drops of rain. So anything that says showers, we might disregard. Um, and it's on the surface, so let's actually think about that again. If it's on the surface, the wind at altitude follows the isobars, but then it backs down. So it's going to be maybe more in the region of about 220, maybe 200. It's going to be backing as it goes down in towards the friction layer. So in that case, I would discount 260 because that's exactly, I would say, what the isobar is doing. I would also discount thunderstorms and hail. Um, heavy rain scattered at 1100, scattered at 800, I would say it's probably D. Um, although it's 5.50 UTC, so that's like first thing in the morning. It's not going to be very... Uh, warm. It's not going to be 22 degrees first in the morning, necessarily. Well, it could be in the summer, I suppose. Um, scattered at 800, scattered 1,100. Hard to tell, but I'm going to go D. Ah, it was the other one. Of course it was. So let's see what they're saying, justifying. In the absence of any time indication on the chart, we must assume that it is relevant to the time state in the question. Yes. Um, the approach of the warm front vehicle being steady continuous rain from overcast cloud with moderate to poor visibility. So, yeah, okay. That's why I had that as my second option. Um, okay, so refer to the annex. What are the expected upper wind patterns in July? Okay, so upper wind patterns in July. So July in the Northern Hemisphere, or July in general, everything's going to move a bit further north in terms of the... Um, yeah, everything's going to move a bit further north, basically. So let's think of maybe three and two as our options. Um, we're going to be getting pulled around to the left, I would say two. What's the significance of the red and the blue? Is it just direction? No, it's just direction. Hmm. Uh, let's think about it. Why would you get two like that? Maybe three, option three? No, option one. This is a climatology question. With the annex showing generalized global upper wind patterns in the northern side, with the upper wind pattern predominantly westly, but significantly easily develops in July, just north of the equator. Yeah, that's, uh, that's my lack of knowledge there. Okay. In the TAF for Athens during the summer, for the time you're landing, you note know, tempo thunderstorms. What is the maximum time this deterioration in weather can last in any one? So tempo's an hour maximum. So there you go. 
the approximate inclined plane of a warm front is 1 in 150. Ooh, that's testing my memory. Yes. And 1 in 50 for a cold front. Yes, that's right. Okay. Um, sorry, I'm just looking at comments now. Joel, will you upload it? Yes, this will just stay online after the end of the stream. You can watch it back. That's what. It's just a very easy way to upload, basically, is by doing this. Um, so it will go on the website, uh, the YouTube, after I've finished. All right, what is the meaning of the abbreviation scattered? Scattered 3 4. Uh, few, scattered, broken, 1 4 is nothing. Which of the following represents a squall line? severe squall lines. So you've got a uh, cold front, occluder front, warm front. One's got a squall line. Yeah. Which thunderstorms generally develop in the afternoon in summer over land in moderate latitudes? Um, which thunderstorms generally develop in the afternoon in summer over land in moderate latitudes? Warm front thunderstorms, air mass thunderstorms, Occlusions, thunderstorms, occlusion thunderstorms, air mass thunderstorms, warm front thunderstorms, you don't really get warm front thunderstorms, cold mass, air mass thunderstorms, yeah. A dry sand and dust laden northeasterly wind that blows in winter over large parts of North and West Africa is known as Sirocco, blows up into Europe. Northeasterly, oh no, ah, Sirocco is blowing south towards Europe. This is the um, African monsoon almost, so in the, yes, it's the Harmattan wind. What's the name of the northerly cold and strong wind that sometimes blows over certain parts of Europe? Northerly cold and strong, you can get the Phone wind, a typhoon, no, a Sirocco, no. Mistral is the one that blows down through the Rhone Valley, is that right? Yes. Down the Rhone Valley, yeah. Refer to the annex, the air mass affecting position R is most likely to be. So this is the polar front depressions. This is going to be tropical air, this is going to be polar air. Um so this is going to be polar. Maritime, maritime polar, yes, cool. Refer to the image, the weather most likely to be experienced in position A is up near Shetland somewhere in the north here. Um, so we're looking at January. Okay, that's, that's a good clue, it's gonna be cold. Um, we are not experiencing any fronts, the weather is quite far apart. The isobars are quite far apart. So, would we think gale force wind? Probably not. Continuous drizzle and hill fog. Mm, hard to say. Advection fog. Quite hard to say. Clear skies, radiation fog forming overnight. Hmm. Well, it's nothing frontal. I'm going to go for clear skies. No? Snow showers and gear force wind. Oh, of course it's the air masses moving in, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. The validity of a routine TAF is, could be anything. It's 24 hours, it's stated in the TAF. Yes, it's stated at the start of the TAF. What is an aerodrome warning? Um, a message issued by a meteorological office concerning the meteorological conditions which could adversely affect aircraft on ground, including parked aircraft and the aerodrome facilities and services. Sounds reasonable. A message prepared by a meteorological office concerning wind shear which could adversely affect aircraft on the approach path, takeoff path, or during certain approach to runway. Um, no, I don't think so. 
the part of the meter message that is called supplementary information. Mm. No. A message issued by a meteorological watch office concerning the occurrence and or expected occurrence of specified on route weather phenomena, which may so that would be a um sigmet, that bottom one. An aerodrome warning sounds like it would be A. Yes. The morning following a clear calm night when the temperature has dropped to the dew point is most likely to produce radiation fog. What is the main composition of clouds classified as high level clouds? It's going to be like ice crystals um, because it's just too cold up there for water to exist in liquid form. Ice secretion to the airframe is likely to be most hazardous at temperatures between 0 and minus 23 in a large cumulus. Yes, because it's going to be large uh, water droplets which forms clear ice rather than or frost or brine ice, so I would say C. Yes, cool. What is the meaning of the different coloured areas on a plan position indicator of an airborne weather radar type? Oh, right, okay, so this is something I didn't really talk about, but it's kind of dependent on um, what aircraft you'd fly. So Say you have your weather radar like this, you'll have a, a fan shaped sort of beam and you'll get these uh, pockets of clouds that are like red, then it'll be yellow, and then at the very outside it'll be, well it's not green is it, but it'll be kind of green like that. And it'll be a random shape. And basically the more severe the precipitation is um, then the darker the color. So in this case the green would be like pretty calm, you could maybe fly through some of the green, you don't want to fly through the yellow um, and you really don't want to fly through the red. So if we were heading up in uh, this direction we'd maybe want to turn instead of being on heading 360 degrees, maybe we would want to turn over to 030 degrees fly over here, come around like this, and then get back on to our planned route. So basically it's the intensities of the precipitation, which um, also indicates the intensity of the cloud. Um, so different intensities of turbulence within clouds, I suppose it kind of is doing that. Um, it's doing the different horizontal dimensions of the clouds, no. Different ranges of cloud thickness, vertical extent, no. Different ranges of intensities of precipitation, yes. Cool. Um, what are the typical characteristics of a tropical rain climate? So we're thinking, yeah, rainforest. Relative humidity, 80%, yeah, pretty likely. Relative humidity, 80%, yeah, pretty likely. 50%, nah. Relative 90, yeah, pretty likely. Freezing level at 10,000 feet, freezing level at 22,000 feet, freezing level at 15,000 feet. Average temperature 28, average temperature 30, average temperature 20. So I would say average temperature is going to be quite high and the freezing level is going to be quite high as well because it's so hot on the ground. So let's just do quick maths. If we say it's um, an average temperature of 28 degrees and we um, just check to see if what I'm doing is basically checking to see if these numbers match for the standard lapse rate. So two degrees per thousand foot is um, 30 degrees, so that's gonna be minus Two degrees per thousand feet, so that's 30. Minus 30 from that is going to be minus 2, which means the freezing level is going to be maybe about 16,000 feet in reality. For this question, 
if it's average temperature is 30 degrees and we go down by 2 degrees every 1,000 feet, we're only going to get to 10 degrees by 10,000. That wasn't even the question I was looking at. We'd already discounted that one. This one. Uh, so 32 minus 40, 2 degrees per 1,000 feet, 40, 4. That's going to be well below 32. It's going to be what? Minus uh, 12. 44. So that, yeah, so I'm going to say A. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly what I did there. I got the check to see if the numbers match, basically. Um, assuming a generalized zonal system of world wind circulation, the northeast, tra northeast trade winds. So the ones that come from the northeast are. Uh, intertropical conversion zone rises, comes down, descends. We've got high, we've got low pressure, high to low, pulled round to the right. So, or yeah, high to low, pulled round to the right. Yes, that sounds. Is that right? Yeah, that is. So uniform. Yes. Um, considering the North Atlantic region between 30 degrees north and 65 degrees north, the mean position of the polar front during the summer extends from. So in the summer, it's going to be higher up. So oof. Newfoundland to North, north Scotland, Florida to Southwest England, Northeast Canada to Iceland, Greenland to Spain. So Greenland to Spain is sort of weird because that's sort of angled down. Northeast Canada to Iceland seems a bit too high. Florida Southwest England seems a bit low, so I'm going to go A. Yes. In the winter, the polar front runs from Florida to Folkestone, and in the summer, it's Newfoundland to Norway. That's quite a good way. Newfoundland to Norway in the winter. Um, in which of the following weather reports could, in accordance with the regulations, the abbreviation Cabo K be used? So Cabo K, cloud and visibility. Okay, so visibility more than 10K and cloud ceiling above 5,000 or the MSA. Is that right? Um, okay, well, 10K biz. So that's not 10K, that's not 10K, that's not 10K. This is 10K. So I think it's broken at 5,000. That's ceiling at 5,000 D, yes. Visibility 10K or more, no cloud below 5,000 meters or below the highest minimum set yet, or the MSA. Whichever is greater, no cumulonimbus, no weather phenomena. Cap okay. Cool. 38. A plane in Western Europe with an average height of 1,600 feet above sea level is covered with a uniform uh, CC layer of cloud during the summer months. At what height above the ground is the base of this cloud to be expected? Uniform CC. Cumulus cirrus? Cirrocumulus? Cirrocumulus? Very high up. Is that what CC means? Cirrocumulus? So that's going to be quite high. Is it going to be up around here? 7,000 to 1,500 feet? Yeah. No, even higher it is cirrocumulus. Okay, so very high level. Yeah. Cool. Um, refer to image. The front labeled at Z is got the suns on it, which means it's warm, warm front. Just look at the symbol. <laughs> Just know the answer. Uh, where is the projection of the polar front jet stream on the surface most likely to be found in relation to the cold and warm fronts of a depression? The projection of the polar front jet stream on the surface most likely to be found in relation to the cold and warm fronts of a depression. Um, what is that asking? The projection of the polar front jet stream, not jet stream, on the surface most likely to be found in relation to the cold and warm fronts of a depression. Hmm. That is a good question. 
So I think what it's asking, it's a tricky one. So you've got your polar front depression coming up, something like this. And you've got your, uh, your warm front and your cold front. And generally a jet stream will kind of go like that with whatever strength it is. So I would say it's behind the cold front, these are the cold front. Either side of the cold front, behind the cold front, I would say it's behind the cold front. A? Yeah. The cold front is steeper, so it's going to be closer to the back of the cold front than it is at the off of the front of the warm front. If that makes any sense, that'll probably not. Cool. Halfway through, how many have we got wrong? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven out of 40. Well, what's 75% of 40? That's about. Oh God, maths, 30, yeah. So I'm on course for 75% still with seven wrong. That's maths. Um, cool. Sir Cumulus, 16,500 euro above, yeah. Aisha has it. Sir Cumulus, you know, no wind. Is this Bristol Ground School? Yes, this is Bristol Ground School, the app. Uh, the website, keep on going out. You know what I mean. Um, yes, okay. Let's go on to the next ones and get rid of this. Sorry, I'm just narrating my way through this, but you get the idea. Um, what is a radio sound? Jesus, I've heard of that for ages. Did not talk about this in my classes at all. Uh, equipment using, used for determining upper winds, velocity and direction by transmitting different radio waves and measuring the amount of reflected waves by the moving air. These values correlate to the speed and direction of the wind. I'm almost certain it's that first one. But equipment used for determining upper winds only, velocity and direction by tracking a free balloon by electronic means at the observing station. Instrument intended to be carried up by a balloon through the atmosphere equipped with devices to measure meteorological variables and provided with a radio transmitter for sending the information to the observing station, a meteorological station on the ground or water at which measurements of meteorological variables are made automatically and a radio transmitter sends automatically this information to a meteorological centre. These data from such a station are indicated in a meta by the term auto. Go with my gut. No. Instrument, it's a radio sound is a pack of instruments designed to measure atmospheric temperature, pressure, and humidity with a radio transmitter to send this data to ground stations. The device is carried in the troposphere by a helium balloon. It can be trapped by radar. Well, there you go. New information to me. Uh, where does polar continental air originate? So, polar. Um, not Arctic, so the one down. Region of the Azores, no, that's Azores is going to be maritime. Polar ice cap. Um, could be, but more likely, is Siberian landmass. From Russia with love, but not much heat. What device is used to measure relative humidity? Oh, God. Tinch tensiometer? Anemometer is pressure, isn't it? Transiome transmitter. That's uh visibility. Hygrometer. Hygro water humidity. Hygro hydro. Yeah. Oh anemometer is wind speed, of course. A tensiometer measures liquid surface tension and a transiometer measures soil moisture content. Oh, it's a transmissometer, I'm thinking of, that measures the um, visibility of the air. RBRs. Cool. The diameter of a typical tornado, they're quite small. Um, tornado, only 100 to 150 metres. 
two to six kilometers in the order of 10 kilometers that sounds too big these two only a few meters 100 to 500 meters sounds a bit about right the core diameter is measured in tens or hundreds of meters yes what is a specky it's a special metar um, an aerodrome forecast issued every nine hours no a warning of meteorological dangers at an aerodrome issued only when it's required a routine aerodrome weather report issued every three hours routine no a special aerodrome speckle specky special aerodrome weather report issued when significant change of the weather conditions have been observed d unexpected unforecast change in the weather yes refer to the image Select from the map the average wind for the route Frankfurt to Rome at flight level 170. Okay, Frankfurt to Rome. Oh, that's such a bad picture. Okay, um, I'm just going to write down the average winds so that I don't have to look at this thing for any longer than I need to. Um, so Frankfurt to Rome, that's average wind is about 55 from 55 knots. Then we've got, yeah, 55. Oh no, not 55 at all. 15. And then another 15. And then, what's up? That's 35. Next one down is 50. And it's all generally from the sort of south westerly direction. Maybe averaging more south west west okay right average wind speed for that route is 30 plus 35 is 65 plus 50 is 115 divide that by 4 we've got about uh, 28 0.75 um, so let's call it 29 uh, that's the strength and that's at flight level 180 so chances are it's going to be a bit weaker lower down so have I done this right? forever to roam I've just taken these ones maybe I should be taking these ones as well we should probably be looking at these winds and these ones over here but let's go for it's not gonna be these they're the wrong direction 250 230 40 yeah almost 70 knots over Rome oh yeah okay so yeah they're taking the average of they've picked a few on the route cool which flight level corresponds to the 250 hectopascal flight level? So this is the thing I was talking about where you need to remember in the study session where they talk about hectopascal pressure levels and it's not the standard atmosphere. You can't use the lapse rate. So you've got flight level 50, flight level 100, 180, 300 and 390. And you can remember this is 300 hectopascals. This is the flight levels. Ooh. flight levels and this is the hectopascals 50 is 850 this is 700 300 uh, 200 and 500 so if it's talking about 250 we can make a guess that it's going to be in between 390 and 300 340 cool um right next question let's hide that phone screen Sorry. 
not to strat there. Um, one of the main reasons for radiation fog to dissipate or become low stratus is an increase in the wind speed. Um, dissipate or become low stratus. Surface heating causes things to rise. Decreasing wind speed, no. Lift against the slope of a hill. Surface heating causes things to rise. After passing at right angles through a very active cold front in the direction towards the cold air, what will you encounter? A flight level 5 zero in the northern hemisphere immediately after a marked change in temperature. Okay, so let's draw the effing picture. Right angles through a very active cold front. So cold front in the direction towards the cold air. So let's go cold front. Let's imagine it was part of a, a depression, a polar front depression, so you'd get this sort of pattern with the isobars. You're passing at 90 degrees to it, so you're going to pass straight through like this. What you're going to experience in the wind direction, so in the direction towards the cold air, so that is towards the cold air, yes. So this is our warm front up here um, immediately after it. So the flight level 5 zeros were outside of the um, friction layer. We're in the free stream air. We're thinking about wind following the isobars and the direction it does, uh, direction changes from being uh, sort of uh, at clockwise right below. So it's going to be sort of south westerly to more northwesterly. So that would be it veering in direction. Yeah, cool. Sometimes you just need to draw it out. Helps you visualize everything a bit better. Cool. Uh, you're flying a flight level 300 where the outside air temperature is minus 57.5 and the pressure at mean scene level is standard 101.25. If you assume that the difference between the actual temperature and the temperature in the ice is valid for the whole troposphere then the true altitude is okay so and the pressure at mean sea level so we're in a ba -da -ba -da -ba, that's the temperature so basically it's asking us to find the true altitude using the temperature correction which if you remember is uh, four feet per 1000 feet times the ice deviation so we've got four times, flight level 300 is 30, times the ISA deviation. So the actual um, temperature it should be at flight level 300, that's what we're trying to figure out, is then we'll figure out the ISA deviation. So 15 minus 30 times two is 60, equals minus 45. Um, so that should be the temperature, it's actually minus 57.5. So that is 12 and a half degrees colder. So this is going to be our difference in here that we then add on uh, 12.5 degrees colder that we take away from flight level 300 to find our true altitude. So 4 times 30 is 120 times 12.5 is... 1500 so it's 1500 feet lower than flight level 300 so it's going to be 285 answer A so this is exactly what we did Ooh, can't see that exactly what we did there cool Um, next question. What types of cloud will you see it flying? Will you see flying at flight level five zero towards a warm front? So at some eight hundred kilometers. So you're flying towards the warm front. Warm front's nice and shallow, and it starts off with cirrus clouds at the top, wispy sort of things. You get into more stratus, and uh, alt stratus, and then stratus there. So. And some 500 kilometers out of stratus later, cirro stratus, no. You see the cir cirrus clouds in any form first. 
and at some 800 kilometers Cirrus Stratus, later Alto Stratus, and at some 300 kilometers Nimbus Stratus until the front, probably, at some 500 kilometers from the front, uh, groups of CBs, no, not likely, probably C. As you approach the front, cloud base gets lower, progressively lower, but usually no CBs in the warm front, yes. 52. In the following TAF, what is the forecast weather at 0800 UTC for Amsterdam? So it's issued on the 15th at 11 Zulu, valid for the 16th from midnight until 9 a.m. So it starts off at midnight doing this. We're not interested, we're different, interested at 8 in the morning. So becoming at 2 in the morning, so now it's changed to this. Overcast tempo until six, so then it reverts back to this. Becoming from four to six, it's going to change completely to this conditions, and then tempo at seven to nine, going to be some snow showers. So, um, tempo for not more than an hour in between seven and nine. So, the forecast weather is most likely eight o'clock. That hour will cover this period. So we're thinking of snow showers, uh, heavy snow or no significant weather. No significant weather, yeah, I suppose in the option it's not. Um, moderate snow showers, there's no plus, which means it's not heavy. If there was a plus SHSN, that would be heavy. So moderate snow showers or no significant weather. Moderate snow showers or heavy snow, light snow or moderate snow showers, B. Well, it took a while to think about that, but yeah. Refer to the image, on which of these routes would you not need to worry about icing at flight level 170? So no icing at 170. And what routes have we got? We've got Zurich to Athens, Paris to Lisbon, Madrid to Vienna and London to Stockholm. Oh, they're all drawn on the map sound. Okay, so a flood of a 170. Cool. All right, no need to worry about icing at all. Oh, God, the quality of these images is just so poor sometimes. Okay, London to Stockholm. Uh, number two looks like it's valid to that. That's moderate turbulence. Looks like this is a patch of icing here. That would be, yeah, moderate icing. Okay, so Lisbon to Paris. What areas are we going through? We're going through an icing area here. Um, 200 to below the bottom of the chart, so that's covering 170. That's this area in here and this one in here, 280 to below the bottom of the chart. So Lisbon to Paris, no. Uh, Madrid to Vienna, from 120, that's fine, we'll be above that. 180, you've got icing in this section. And then Zurich to Athens, you've got this section in here, isolated CBs, what is this one, 180 to below the bottom of the chart, some icing. Is that this section? This is very hard to read. I think this, it's either 120 below, 180 below. Is that this section? No, that's just the coastline there, okay. Um, Zurich to Athens. This one, isolated CBs. Then we've got this one. I think it's Zero to Athens. London to Stockholm. Only to 120. Ah, that's 120. Okay, I thought that said 320. Fair enough. See, the quality of the image, poor, poor, poor. Um, right, so some comments, what's people saying? 
C. Cool, yeah. Um, on final approach in the evening, you have a wind from the west and there is haze, so man-made sort of stuff in the, uh, no, sorry, near the ground. What can you say about the visibility in the last phase of the approach? In the evening, you have wind from the west. There's haze near the ground. So wind from the west, that's quite a good, something you might not think about. So wind from the west, you want to land into the wind. Okay, so we're gonna be landing this way. This is gonna be the aircraft coming into land here. Okay. So in the evening, you can say that maybe the sun is setting because the sun sets in the west, all right? So the sun is at a low angle, yes. And the visibility will deteriorate close to the ground, yes, because you've got haze near the ground. The increase in wind strength close to the ground will tend to clear the haze and improve visibility. Wind doesn't increase uh, in strength close to the ground, it backs off close to the ground. The visibility will improve as the haze reduces the blinding effect of the sun. No, you'll most likely get kind of like a scatter effect. The visibility will deteriorate in the northern hemisphere but improve in the southern hemisphere. That's completely irrelevant. A. Seems to assume you already are landing into the wind. No, sorry. Uh, this question seems to assume that you are landing into wind. Well, yeah, that's what you do. You land into wind. And therefore landing in a westerly direction is the evening, so the sun will be low. Yeah, cool. When an aircraft is approaching a CB cloud, the vertical distance it should avoid the cloud by is, and the horizontal distance is. Oof, good question. You want to avoid them by a lot? I would say 3,025. Seems reasonable. 5,000, 6,000 feet is quite a long way vertical. It might not be possible. 3,000 is more likely and it's more the horizontal distance that I think you should be interested in. So D. No, 5,010. At least 10 nautical miles if it's tall, yeah. Fair enough. Cool. Uh, relative humidity at a given temperature is a relation between actual water vapour content and saturated water vapour content. Relative humidity. What's in, what you can hold. The ratio of how much water vapour there is compared to how much you can hold. Cool. Which of the following statements describes the theoretical development of the geostrophic wind in the Northern Hemisphere? Okay, um, an air parcel initially at rest will move from high pressure to low pressure because of the Coriolis force. No, that's because of the pressure gradient force, so I'm going to disregard that. As the air starts to move and is accelerated by the pressure gradient force, yes, it is increasingly deflected to the right by the Coriolis force until both forces are balanced and opposite to each other. B sounds good. Uh, as the surface pressure difference as a surface pressure difference starts, air will begin to move towards lower pressure, yes. As the wind gains speed, the pressure gradient force deflection increases to the right until it equals the Coriolis force. No, so it's the deflection to the right is caused by the Coriolis force, not the pressure gradient force. The pressure gradient force moves the air towards the low pressure, but surface friction starts to pull the air anti-clockwise. No, B. An air pressure initially at rest will move from high pressure to low pressure because of the pressure gradient force, yeah. Uh, if the wings of an aircraft are contaminated with ice, one can expect the aircraft to have degraded stall characteristics and problems with roll manoeuvres. Degraded stall characteristics but better gust response to you to an improved roll behaviour. A degraded response in the roll pitch and yaw axis but improved stall characteristics due to the increased wing area, no. Nearly unchanged stall characteristics of the wing ice will mostly form the thickest and thus innermost part of the wing. So no, it's, it's your stalling is gonna go 
uh, you're going to have to fly faster because you've got more weight and you need to produce more lift. And it's um, basically half, if you don't know, I'm sure you do, but the formula is half rho v squared s c l equals your lift. You need more lift because you've got more weight. You can't change the density of the air. Um, so you need to fly faster. So therefore your stall characteristics will be degraded. You need to fly faster to maintain the speed. So your stall speed is higher. You will stall at a higher speed. And also your coefficient of lift will be degraded because the surface of the wing becomes not perfect and the airflow gets disrupted around it. Um, so with that information, degraded stall characteristics and problems with roll maneuvers, but better gust response proved and uh, improved roll performance. I think it'd be a problems with roll maneuvers, yeah. The decrease in temperature per 100 meters in a saturated rising parcel air of air at lower levels in the atmosphere is approximately. Okay, so saturated adiabatic collapse rate is 1.8 per thousand feet per thousand feet. And uh, so a thousand feet is like 300. No, what am I doing? 1.8 times 3.28 would equal, yeah, so that would equal per thousand meters, because that to that is 3.28. Multiply by 3.28 to get that thousand meters, so that would be 5.9. Just doing this on a calculator off screen. Um, and then divide it by uh, 10, get 0 0.59 per 100 meters, uh, what's closest to that, C, there you go, yeah, 1.8 degrees per thousand feet, cool. Um, in the North Atlantic, you can see, you can often see, a series of depressions located in a row and traveling from west to east. These depressions are Polar front depressions are residual of tropical cyclones in the Florida area. Oh, excuse me, I'm going to burp. Oh, wait, there we go. Um, <laughs> uh, are mostly generated by convergence between the subtropical highs and the equatorial trough. Are normally generated. The polar front, polar front depressions, yeah, are primarily generated by the vaporization process that takes place above the open sea. Westerly wave depressions, polar front depressions. By use of Doppler techniques, modern airborne weather radar can detect turbulence in uh, the tropopause, thunderstorms, stratiform clouds, mm, thunderstorms. It should not be appreciated that airborne weather radar is designed for avoiding severe weather, not for penetrating it. It should not be. It should. Be appreciated. I got. Can't read. Weather detection is based on the, the reflectivity of water droplets. The weather echo usually appears on modern color radars as color return that goes from red to green. The weather radar echo returns vary in, in intensity as a function of the droplet size. Blah 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 blah. Yeah, you can. You, yeah, you can detect turbulence, but only if there's water droplets present. An aircraft flying in the southern hemisphere at 2,000 feet has to turn to the right in order to allow for drift. In which direction relative to the aircraft is the centre of the low pressure? Right, draw the effing picture. So we are in low pressure. Normally in the northern hemisphere we go anti-clockwise, but we're in the southern hemisphere so we're going clockwise round like this. Okay, and an aircraft has to turn to the right in order to allow for drift. So they've got to go into the, um, turning into the wind. So they're turning to fly straight like this. They'll be turning into the wind with their heading to get their track going 
in a straight line. So the low pressure is in front of them. Yeah, there you go. Where do you find the majority of the air within the atmosphere? Low down. Drop sphere. Drop sphere, then the tropopause, then the stratosphere. Stratopause, uh, mesosphere, mesopause, exo or thermosphere after that. So, drop sphere. Yes. Temperature at flight level 010 is minus 5. What will the temperature at flight level 50 be if the uh, standard ICAO lapse rate is applied? So we're kind of working a bit in reverse. So from 110 down to 50 is 6,000 feet. So six times uh, two degrees per thousand foot equals 18. And the temperature is minus five plus 18 minus 15 minus Minus 5 plus 18 is going to be 13 degrees. Six times two being 18, of course it is, Grant. You absolute idiot. <laughs> five, minus five plus 12 is seven. There we go. Yeah, do an idiot check, check your maths. Um, isotachs are lines joining equal what? So sea level pressures, no that's isobars, wind speed lapse rates, wind speeds, horizontal wind speeds, I would say wind speeds. Yeah. Freezing rain can reduce visibility severely by forming ice on the windshield, yeah, preventing lookout from the cockpit, yeah. Normally you would have some sort of device so that your cockpit doesn't get iced up, like just a heater or um, sometimes they have like a metal element running through them that heats up. Um, by force. Freezing rain can reduce visibility by forming ice pellets by the Bergeron process. Dense fog due to evaporation of a portion of the supercooled water drop that's mixed ice in the air before hitting the wheel suit. A. Freezing rain is the result of liquid water raindrops coming into contact with surfaces that are below zero degrees where they freeze into sheets of hard, clear ice. Yeah, cool. In a westerly situation, the mean time interval between polar frontal waves in Western Europe is couple days in between them, three to four, 12 to 18 hours, three to four days, one to two days, oh, whatever. Um, which constant pressure chart is standard for 240? So 300 is flight level 300 and 180 is 500. So it's gonna be in between those two. In which of the following areas do surface high pressure systems usually predominate over the North Atlantic region between 30 degrees north and 65 degrees north and the adjoining land areas during the northern summer? Surface high pressure systems, Northern Hemisphere summer, uh, so the Azores highs you get, they're definitely a thing. Sorry, what high pressure systems usually predominate over the North Atlantic? So the Azor highs, Southwest Europe, that would make sense. And Southeast USA, Greenland, yeah, maybe Northeast Canada. There is predominantly low pressure over Iceland, Greenland, and Northern Canada, the subtropical anticyclone. All oh, right, so there'd be low pressure over the large land masses like Greenland and Canada. So that's why it's not them. So you're looking at places that don't have huge areas of land immediately. And then you're going um, subtropical anticyclone. 
the Azores is predominant and Iceland is probably just a bit too um, yeah why not Iceland oh well maybe it's a bit too close to Greenland it's getting affected by that we'll see right any final comments before we finish off Um, sorry, I'm having a quick look at comments here. Thanks for this. Oh God, quite a few. It's good to see. Um, do you want to go back? Oh, K. Roberts, what question would you like? And I'll go back to it at the end and explain. Um, just comment what question it was. And I'll uh, yeah go back to it and try to explain. If I can't explain, then I do apologize. Right, so let's carry on. Uh, what is the approximate yearly frequency of tropical revolving storms in southwest Pacific east of Australia? Oh God, how many storms are there in southwest Pacific east of Australia? Yearly frequency, tropical revolving storms. That's big ones. So maybe that'll be a clue. Tropical evolving storms are when it's over, uh, what, 63 knots or something like that? So it's not gonna be that many. It's not gonna be 23, maybe five, nine. Oh, so I had the sort of the right thinking. It wasn't gonna be many. Four or five would become, yeah, a bit too many, okay. Um, which of the following are favorable conditions for the formation of freezing rain? So you need large water droplets for freezing rain. So question A, uh, answer A, water droplets falling from cloud air aloft with a temperature below zero into air with a temperature above zero. That's not a bad one. An isothermal layer aloft with a temperature just above zero degrees through which rain is falling. Cold air aloft from which hail is falling into air that is warm. So ice that is melted, that could be freezing rain, yes. Warm air aloft which rain is falling into air with a temperature below zero degrees. God, this is some confusing wording. Um, I'm gonna go for C, cold air, because hail falls, it melts. Water droplets, super cooled water droplets into air with a temperature above zero. That could be it as well. More likely for freezing rain, I would say is A actually. Warm air, oh God, completely wrong. Okay, so warm air aloft from which rain is falling into air with a temperature below zero degrees. Rain falls on a cloud of temperature just above freezing into air with a temperature just below freezing. Okay. Um. How many have I got wrong so far? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. I've not got that many more to get wrong until I've uh, got less than 75. Okay, let's, uh, let's focus. <laughs> For an aircraft making an approach into the airfield located at square 3B, 3B, bottom down here. Um. Away from the vicinity of the fronts, the most likely the weather conditions in winter are um, it's going to be prolonged periods of heavy, poor visibility and mist and drizzle. Mist and drizzle, fairly likely. Generally overcast, moderate continuous rain and a risk of low level wind shears. Um, so we're going to be in a low pressure area. It's going to be generally overcast. Moderate continuous rain and risk of low level wind shear. Prolonged periods of heavy rain and hail. Mm. Scattered. Cumulus. Poor visibility, mist and drizzle. Generally overcast, I think. Poor visibility, mist and drizzle. Oh, was... Hmm, not having a good run. 
here, three is row wrong. Why are indications about height of the tropos considered non-essential in flight documentation for flight in the tropics? So in the tropics, they're very the tropos is really high up. Um, so the temperatures of the tropical tropos are always very low and therefore not important. The meteorological services are unable to provide such a chart. The tropos are always the same height. The tropos is generally well above the flight level actually flown in the air. That's right. Cool. Surface wind is the wind that results when the pressure gradient force in the layer of air near the surface is reduced by the effect of friction. Air flow near to the surface that is reduced by the strength, reduced in strength by the effect of friction. Air flow near to the surface that slows down due to the effect of an increase in air density. No, wind that experiences an increase in the Coriolis force effect brought about by the increase in, so it's actually a reduction in the Coriolis force. A wind that results when the pressure gradient in the layer of air near the surface is reduced. B, yeah. Which of the following is typical for s the snow tundra climate? Um, cool, temperatures generally between plus five and 18 throughout the whole year. Traveling depressions during winter time, high pressure weather dominates in winter with the subsoil being frozen. High pressure weather dominates in the winter. So in the winter, in the summer, high pressure weather um, dominating in the winter subsoil being frozen, permafrost in the tundra. A wind sounding in the region of a polar front jet stream gives the following wind profile in the North Hemisphere. At 900 hectopascals it's this, 800 it's this, 700 it's this, blah blah blah. With which jets, which with, with which system is the jet stream associated? Ah, okay, right. So, wait, what? 900, 800, 700, 500, 400. Okay, right, so, it's basically, there's various levels here, but it's all sort of generally coming from a west west direction and then slightly north. So if we think about that as the jet stream around a polar front depression, that would be a warm front. That makes sense? Yeah. Let's look at the explanation because I, I don't think I've really done a very good job there. The core of the jet, the greatest speed, is at approximately 330. The direction of the core is from 310 degrees true. With a typical northern hemisphere frontal system, the cold front jet is from southwest and the warm front is from the northwest. There you go. following weather message for Munich is a what oh right okay <laughs> okay it's telling you what it is so it doesn't say Specky or Metar so it's not them because they say Metar and Specky at the front so it's going to be a TAF and we're basically looking for the validity period so it's on the 24th issued on the 24th at 12 Zulu and it's valid for the 24th from 1 p.m. till 10 p.m. So it's nine hours. What is the approximate maximum diameter of the area affected by damaging winds at the surface caused by a microburst? So microburst are generally less than four kilometers. Yes. If embedded CBs are reported in the vicinity of the airfield, the pilot can be sure that the airfield area will be free, free of hail. Mm, don't think so. Perform a visual pattern in order to circumnavigate the storms. Not necessarily. Might be 
pre weather conditions that you can't fly visually. Um, well, actually, it is. If they're embedded, that means they're within other clouds, so you won't be able to fly visually. Expect that associated thunderstorms will be attenuated. Use a storm scope to locate and avoid the cells. What is a storm scope? That sounds cool. Um, vicinity of the airfield. I don't really understand this question. I mean, a storm scope, is that just like part of a weather radar? A storm scope it le detects electrical discharges associated with thunderstorms within up to about 200 nautical miles of the radius. This information is then sent to an MFD that pilots that plots the location of the associated thunderstorms. It is a lightweight, relatively inexpensive system and is a passive sensor. It can also see behind the nearest storm, whereas masking can occur with active weather radar systems. Of the other options, you can never be sure that CBs will contain no hail. Yes, CBs are embedded so visual avoidance can be achieved. Attenuate means reducing strength. Why would you expect any thunderstorms associated with the CB will be reduced in strength? Okay. And last question. That's uh, not bad time actually. Just over well, about an hour and a half at the end of it, I think. Um, an aircraft is departing an airport where the transition altitude is 6,000 feet. Um, ATC report the QNH is 1028 and the surface temperature is 35 degrees. What is the approximate reading expected on the altimeter if the pilot changes the subscale setting when climbing through the transition altitude? Assume 27 feet per hectopascal. All right, so temperature corrections would not be applied to uh, your altimeter. So we can kind of ignore the temperature there. And the transition altitude is 6,000 feet. And at 1028, we're going to change to, so at 6,000 feet, sorry, we're going to change to standard. So 6,000 feet is based off of 1028. I assume it means you're yeah so that at the transition altitude if you don't know what it is when you climb through the transition altitude on your aircraft you switch over from 1028 to standard pressure setting of 1013 and that means you're now flying on flight levels and on the way down it's a transition level you change from flight levels transition to the local QNH and then you're on local altitude so in this case, we're going to be changing to 1013, which is lower pressure, so it's going to be higher up. So we can think of this difference in here is going to be our altitude difference. So this is our 1013 pressure, 1028. Difference between them is, what, 15 hectopascals times by 27, as it wants in the question. 15 times 27 is um, 405. So uh, let's just say that the difference in altitude is 405 feet. It's going to be 6,000 minus 405. 6,000 minus 405. 5595. Yeah. Cool. ETV, I think I got about 80%. 81.2. There you go. So, you've got quite a scope for making mistakes, as you can see in this one, because it's quite um, quite a lot of questions. I mean, look at this patch here. Got a few groupings here. You've got quite a lot of chance for mistakes in this exam, which makes it quite good. Um, so 80%, pretty happy with that. Um, what was, so somebody wanted to see another question. Have you commented what question it was? Um, oh wow, there's quite a lot of comments now too. Vision. And dun 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 dun. Ah, I can't 
can't find the question that somebody was asking. Um, anyway, let's just call it there. Um, all right, that's us. So there you go, that was uh, an exam. See, we passed it with 81.2%. A lot of scope for mistakes. Um, let's have a quick run through of which ones we got wrong. So it needs to be, yeah, I think I did 10 to 20 degrees or something like that for this question. So which of the temperature bands of is ice most likely to form on the aircraft surface? So it's just below zero. Um, next question, a blocking anticyclone. Yeah, I can't remember that one. Cumulus congestus, I've never even heard of congestus, but it means a marked sprouting normally with excessive vertical extent apparently and resembles a cauliflower lovely explanation there um this was to do with the weather front the warm front approaching and i said the visibility i can't remember i said something like the, the clouds were higher i was thinking it was a little bit further away than which meant the cirrus clouds rather than the sort of um, low level clouds. Refer to the annex. Yeah, this question I didn't really get. Um, that could be worth a look at a bit more revision if I was going for the exam. Climatology question with the annex showing generalized global upper wind patterns in the northern hemisphere. Um, significant easterlies develop in July. There you go. Um, I just skipped over 27, that was that one. 38. Um, Plane and Western, so cumulo, zero cumulus, sorry, high base. I think I chose one that was like 8,000 feet or something. Um, it's quite annoying how I can't see the other answers now, but anyway. A radio sonde, never, didn't remember that from when I was studying. Um, attach it to a balloon, it detects what's going on. Um, question 53. London to Stockholm, yeah, that was kind of, I couldn't read the chart. I thought that was a three, two, zero to the below the chart. It's a one, two, zero. That's, yeah, could have taken a bit more time on that. Horizontal distance you should keep from a CB, a thunderstorm, 10 nautical miles. Yeah, that seems legit. Um, nine strong hurricane cyclones hitting Australia every year. Um, which conditions are most likely for rain? Yep. This one, I'm kind of annoyed that I got that wrong. You should know that. Get about a million polar front depressions hitting the UK every year. Um, yeah, so that's it, guys. Um, hope you found something useful. If you um, are going to tune in for the next bunch of classes, I'll put a vote up shortly on what you'd like to see a poll it's probably going to be between radio navigation performance and maybe engines or electrics one of the agk um subjects but yeah make sure you vote and we'll get started on those videos nice and soon uh thank you for watching and